Today in the studio, we have Tony Ndungu, a techpreneur, innovation architect, and founder of Kitabu, a revolutionary digital textbook subscription system. I'm George Asias, founder of African Speakers and Artists, and I'd like to welcome you to our Trailblazer interview series. Tony, welcome to the ASNA studio. Thank, Thank you very you. much for joining us and for being part of our Trailblazer uh, interview series. Uh, and I'm particularly happy you're here because you always have a, a special place in our heart because yes. you are our first ever speaker booking. Number one. <laughs> you were. <laughs> so you were a founding speaker on our roster and you're our first booking yeah. for, it was a big German company, right? It was. Mm, it in was. an event in Nairobi. Yes. So um, it's very, very good to have you here. Thank you. And, and thank you very much for your, for your support this year. Super. Um, so I'd like to just start by asking a question that I'm sure a lot of people are asking. Yeah. What yeah. is an innovation architect? <laughs> it's a very simple job position. Now, um, mainly an innovation architect looks at the way things are structured and designed mm -hmm. and changes the structure and design of a process mm -hmm. to add innovation into it. So you know uh, every system, any system, doesn't matter whether it's a family setup or it's a government, uh, when you're trying to inject innovation, it disrupts that system. Mm -hmm. And innovation is very good at disruption. So to be able to stabilize the entire ecosystem that you're involved in, mm -hmm. you need an innovation actor to come and say, okay, if you're going to add this to it, this is, this is a, the couple of things you're going to have to change mm -hmm. or move about. And these are the things that you need to put in terms of buffers. Mm. So innovation architects essentially come into a system and restructure the system to be able to accommodate mm. innovation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we, I'm quite fascinated by this Africa rising narrative. Yes. Um, sometimes people support the narrative. Sometimes it's, it's being challenged. Um, and for me, you know, there's been an explosion in, in innovation and entrepreneurship literally in every corner of, of the continent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, how do you see... Uh, Africa rising, um, as how relevant do you see it as it applies to the tech space in East Africa? Yeah, I think Africa rising started in the tech space. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that um, entrepreneurship has, is something that is new because of technology. No, entrepreneurship has been there for ages in Africa. Mm -hmm. The only difference is technology has almost uh, flattened the race. It's flattened the opportunity. It's allowed everybody an opportunity to build up on the Africa rising narrative. Mm -hmm. And um, I do know that the fastest accelerator for, for the Africa rising um, concept is technology, whether mm -hmm. it's in finance, which we've seen in Kenya and many other parts of, of East Africa, or it's in health or mm -hmm. in education, which I'm involved in. The technology is going to help us leapfrog a lot of the things in terms of infrastructure and knowledge skill that we've mm -hmm. never had yeah. uh, to allow Africa to accelerate. So I know that the Africa rising concept is new, but it's powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, in the next decade, it's going to change the entire continent, irrespective of whether people believe it's going to happen or not. Mm -hmm. That's really not the issue. The issue mm -hmm. is how quickly will it happen and how many people will it carry along with it? Because those mm -hmm. are the things that really matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, a lady who I'm sure you know, Oria Kolo, yeah. who's very well known in Kenya and yeah. who we hope one day to represent. Yeah. Um, and she, she has um, an interesting take on it, which she says that you can't entrepreneurship your way out of bad policy. Yeah. You can't innovate yeah. your way out of bad policy. And a country's context needs to be right in order for innovation to, to take place. That's correct. In your experience this year and, and your own journey leading up to this point, um, have you felt that um, Kenya and Kenya government has helped or hindered your, uh, your own progress? Both. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that people uh, need to appreciate, just like Ori I'm sure appreciates, is that there's a place for policy and government, mm -hmm. and there's a place for innovators. Mm -hmm. And there's always going to be a time when the two of them have to merge, mm -hmm. and, and depending on how that merger feels, you're going to have success or failure. I'll give you a very practical example. Before the mobile money solution succeeded here in Kenya, there's a lot of policy against it mm -hmm. from the already established banking system. Mm -hmm. And they tried their best to suppress it because they felt it was a, a, a very big form of competition for mm -hmm. them. Now what's happened is because the policy wasn't there, mobile money flourished, and now the banks have bought into it, and now every, mobile, every, every bank has a mobile money solution in it. Mm -hmm. And if you try to do that in any other country, even in West Africa, that's a big challenge because the banks have seen what's happened in, Af in East Africa, and they don't necessarily want to see it happen yeah. there. So the policy has been put in place to stop that from growing. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how you interact with the government. If the government sees an opportunity and opens up the policy guidelines for people to try and fail and try again, success. Mm. If they do not, then you have real issues. And I think where Ori is coming from, which makes sense to me, is there's a couple of things that have to be done and have to be done right mm -hmm. for that to happen. For example, an opportunity has to be afforded those who know what they're doing in a new space. Trying to get the old people to do the same thing mm. uh, over and over again will create the different results. Get mm. new people to do a different thing and mm. see where that goes. But at the end of the day, it still comes down to who writes the policy, who signs the document, and who passes these bills. Mm -hmm. And it's still not going to be entrepreneurs and innovators yeah. doing that. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. understood. Um, 
Your, your current project is uh, is Kitabu. Yes. And this is, I'm, I'm assuming, taking up most of your time right now. Yes, and it is. For uh, our viewers who, who um, don't know, Kitabu means book in, in Swahili. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit about the project. We were talking off camera about some of the amazing developments you have coming up. Some yeah. you can discuss, yeah. some you can't. Yes. Um, but it sounds like, um, you know, the education space is uh, ripe for an innovation architect like you to come along and shake things up. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit about Kitabu. Well, Kitabu is Swahili for textbooks, as you said, but it's also 96 other languages. It means mm -hmm. the same thing, whether it's Kitab or Khaitab in Urdu or Pashtu. It, see, it seems that Kitabu and education have always been at the cornerstone of trying to grow a people, mm -hmm. development-wise. Uh, Mathit, you're talking 600, 700 years ago when, when we were talking about the pyramids and the design of education was what moved people from being what they were before to what we call civilized. Yeah. Um, but the education is very expensive, mm -hmm. especially in a developing country, very expensive. And one of the things you need as a cornerstone for education is content, which is even more expensive than mm -hmm. school fees in a country like Kenya where most of the students go to school for free. So what Kitabu is basically doing is getting digital content or digitizing content that's not and allowing users to lease it to rent a page, a chapter, or a book for an hour, a day, a week, a month, or a school mm. term, which takes a book that would essentially cost a thousand shillings or ten dollars and cuts it down to six cents, seven cents per hour mm -hmm. Kenyan shillings, which is even indescribable in US mm -hmm. dollars. And that allows a child who can only be able to afford one page for one hour for one day to be able to get what they need where they need it anywhere. And the beauty of technology is it leapsfrogs the entire infrastructural system of delivery and distribution. Mm -hmm while giving you a monitoring and evaluation tool that allows you to see what every child in every place is reading, studying for how long, whether they like the content or they don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, even when Harry Potter was sold, the only way they knew Harry Potter was a success was based on the number of books that they've sold. Mm -hmm. There was never another feedback loop from end users to the writers. Mm -hmm. And Kitabu allows that. So what you're going to see now over the next five, seven years, if I have anything to do with it, mm -hmm. is a very interactive and pro-student engagement tool for mm -hmm. education where we're not throwing content at you and hoping you're getting smarter, yeah. but where we're actually learning what you want to learn mm -hmm. and collaborating and making you a better person and growing you as an individual. Mm. And I think that's what the essence of innovation is, getting somebody where they are and growing them into the largest, most mm -hmm. potent person yeah. you can be able to create with the little infrastructure mm -hmm. you've got. Okay. Uh, I mean, you know, we're, we're really here to talk about uh, Tony Ndungu, yes. the speaker. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like so many of the speakers that we represent, you, you wear many hats. I think wrapped around technology, but then within that innovation, technology as it applies to education yeah. um, and lots of other areas. Um, what, tell us about the kind of topics that, that you talk about to brands or to academic institutions who, who have hired you this year. You know, what, what are your knowledge areas and what type of uh, presentation style do, do you have? I think there's two things that have stood out. Uh, one of the things about being in technology in Africa is you have to be an evangelist for mm -hmm. it. Um, it's not just about doing the solution and letting people see the solution. It's also about evangelizing and talking about what innovation can do in sectors that I do not know. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the biggest things I've done this year is talk about how to include innovation mm -hmm. in very standard and systematic companies. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people are coming into Africa and realizing, I'll give you an example, Uber came into Kenya, mm -hmm. and they're realizing that, you know what, in other parts of the world, credit cards make sense. In Kenya, mobile money makes sense. But where else does mobile money make sense? Where can we export this idea in East Africa or even other parts of the world where there's a success to it? And most of the topics we've talked about um, as myself, as Tony Dungan, as, as a company, is how to create innovation, how to create an innovation-friendly environment in companies. Mm -hmm. That's big in the German company. We spoke about mm -hmm. the same thing. And it's not just about coming up with products innovatively, but creating an innovative culture and creating a creative space for people, mm -hmm. allowing people to be what they were when they were younger as children, yeah. which is you know, creative, imaginative, yeah. and fearless. Yeah. You cannot have a product that survives in this generation mm -hmm. if your people are not creative, if your people are not imaginative and if, if your people are fearful, mm. those are the three things that destroy, you know, that's, it's, I call it the Kodak fever, mm. where they're afraid of changing from what you know to what you don't know because you're afraid that what you don't know will fail. Yeah. Yeah. This is not that generation. So those are the, that's the main thing I've, I've spoken about. Innovation in, in company culture, in company products and in company systems. That's been mm. huge. And I think that that's, those types of topics are relevant for any organization and every level within that, that organization. Yeah, you that's know, correct. Because these are such universal, universal areas. And especially when you're coming from Africa, I innovation in Africa has been the determinant between whether you live or die. Mm -hmm. you know, more, that definitely is more, more a literal statement mm -hmm. than in any other part of the world. You know, good example is mobile money, for example. Yeah. Good example is mobile tracking, GIS systems, Ushahidi type things, where if you have a disaster and somebody has a feature phone, mm -hmm. between you and that person in that feature phone, what can you do to save their lives? It's really mm -hmm. that that's specific, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And when you go to places like Haiti, where they had a 
terrible earthquake. Mm. How, how, did the, how did the people working there from people like libraries without borders and the Red Cross function? They function with, the, with an application built in Africa because we understand how difficult it is to make something work in a place where there's so little, mm. you know, to, to, there's very little resource to waste. Yeah. And so that's, that's definitely added value to a lot of the talks mm. I've had. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned earlier, this is the Trailblazer interview uh, series, which we've developed. Uh, and I think it goes to that question that you are certainly a, a trailblazer. Thank you. Um, what do you think is, is next in regards to, uh, to innovation in the tech space mm. in Africa? Yeah. And, you know, given that um, things move so fast in tech and, you know, the, the Impesa era seems like so long ago, yeah. even though it probably wasn't. Yeah. Um, what's next? What do, what, what's coming up? I think the two things that stand out when you ask me what's next, uh, it's a global phenomenon called the IoT, the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think it's not going to happen in Africa. It's already happening mm -hmm. in Africa. Internet of Things is huge as it is. But the second thing that I think I'll even focus more on is, is um, the impact that innovation will have in what I call basic services. Mm -hmm. We saw the financial revolution of M-Pesa, which is less than 10 years old. Yeah. Um, now it's getting into education, and Okitab is going to do a phenomenal job with other partners in the, in the space. But then we're going to see things in health that are very, very big, dealing with malaria, dealing with tuberculosis, dealing with HIV, AIDS, and cholera, and the like. And insurance, health insurance. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, people haven't spoken about this for a long time, mm -hmm. but health insurance is something really big. There's an opportunity there. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who can be able to bring uh, a lot of change in the insurance space where you can be able to be sure every child born this minute yeah. is covered fully in good hospitals and, and all that. And the last one is government. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest, one of the things that gives me the greatest hope is because of all the things we have learned as a people, not just as individuals, but as a people in Kenya, for example, to leapfrog, for example, the mobile money solutions, the education solutions, all these things, mm. we're creating a culture of instant change yeah. where you don't have to have an uprising like we did in the Arab Spring to change people's mindsets. Mm -hmm. You just plug in technology and everybody almost overnight swaps onto it. Yeah. And if you're not in that space and you're not ready for it, you'll be kicked out. Yeah. And I can tell you, this is what I've seen in the last couple of uh, years, from the previous Kenyan election mm. to the next Kenyan election, this, this coming on election in 2017, you will see a huge amount of, of campaigning moving from offline to online. Mm. Because even if there's a huge community of people offline, a very large, I mean, a third of Kenya mm. is, is, has never seen the internet. Yeah. And the two thirds that have seen it, you know, it's sporadic for most, and many people are online quite a bit. You're going to find that the two thirds that are online will influence the third that is not. Whereas five years ago, the third that was not online was influencing a lot yeah. of the two thirds that were. So that, that whole dynamic means that the government, the countries, the infrastructure, the systems, everything that has been a status quo is cracking. Mm. And if you know how to crack it, if you know how to take advantage of that, then you are. Yeah. And that's what a lot of Kenyans are doing. Mm. And I can see that happening in East Africa. And we're going to export that to South Africa mm. in, in a matter of years. Mm. Exciting times ahead. It really feels Very. like we're in the right place at the, at the right time. Without a doubt. Yeah. I, I wouldn't see... I, I honestly kind of see the only, the only place more exciting than, than East Africa in technology, mm. in my opinion, to be honest, is, is what's happening in the heart of Silicon Valley. Yeah. And mm. that's, even that is not a far, it's not a far yeah. way off for us. We, a few years we'll be already there. Yeah, I mean, you're a case in point for us. You know, one of the strap lines we like to use as a company is the power of perspective. Yeah. Uh, and listen to, listening to you talk, you know, people really do need to tap into your power of perspective yeah. because yeah. no amount of research or, uh, you know, no. you, you need to hear from people on the ground who are doing yeah. things. And, yeah. and you're definitely one of those people. So, Tony, as you know, I'm one of your biggest fans. Yay. But I know that you have a, a <laughs> fan club all over the world. I'm sure the the, 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 the certainly very, very famous people in the world that are very interested in what, in what you're doing. I think you had a TED talk recently. We had six million viewers. Yes, we, we decided with a friend called uh, Sadka, we, we go to Kibera and try to do a TED talk, tech mm -hmm. talk there. So we did. We got a, I got a generator, you know, got a couple of guys, and we went and did a TED talk in Kibera. We called it TEDx Kibera. Mm -hmm. And we never knew this was going to become a huge hit. And just uh, explain what Kibera is for uh, people that might not be so familiar. Kibera is, was then the largest um, peri-urban area in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, it was a slum, slum joint, but it's not, it's not doing so badly now. Mm -hmm. I've been there a couple of times, it's very nice. Uh, people are improving their lives, but then it was mm -hmm. really dire. Uh, and in the three years that, I mean, since, since we went there, a lot has changed. But when we went there and did a TED, TEDx from, from there, it really changed the mindset of a lot of people because they got to realize what technology can do in Africa. Mm -hmm. and it was a big deal, I think it was 2010. Uh, and we ended up getting six million views for mm -hmm. a tip. <laughs> six million and views. And you got a couple of famous retweets I got as a well. couple of famous, I got a Bill, Bill Gates retweet. You got and a I got Bill a, Gates retweet, that's I got awesome. a Barack Obama follow. 
So that, that's, <laughs> and I think he yeah. only follows like three people, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, so exactly. You're, you're yeah, right yeah. up there. So I was like, wow. Yeah. That is, I'm like, this is for real. Um, <laughs> Did but, you have to pinch yourself when that was happening? You know, no, I, t- yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't. And, and it's, it's really gone up from there because I did a TED Exchange, TED Amsterdam, mm. TED Ex Amsterdam after that, and TED Ex Penn State University after that. But mm. then I think for me, it's not so much talking about stuff mm-hmm. as it is doing stuff. Yeah. I'd much rather be known for doing things and talking about things we can do. Sure. Uh, especially because in, in, in Africa, we need to do things. Mm. We, we, we can't talk about stuff that can't be done. We need to actually do it and show. Yeah. Where, I mean, and this is why it's called the Trailblazer series. Yeah. I believe in that. We need to trailblaze. We actually need to get up there and say, education can be changed. Yeah. So let's yeah. change it. And yeah. whether you have a conversation with Barack Obama or Michelle Obama or Kofi Annan or Grassa Michelle, or um, Richard Branson, the, the, at the end of the day, what you want to know is you've changed many, 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 yeah. many children's lives. Mm-hmm. And that's the goal. For mm-hmm. me, that's the goal. Yeah. It's not about how many people we speak to. Yeah. Um, now, I'm going to ask you to be um, in, to go onto the other side of the fence and be in the audience mm-hmm. at an event mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> allow you to choose three speakers yeah. or one, if you like, yeah. of, um, of somebody that you really would want to hear talk at an event? They could be dead or alive, fictional or real, your choice. Who, who would they be? I think the, the three people that come to mind are Nikola Tesla. Mm-hmm. Um, he died in, the, in, in way, I mean, he's an old school innovator. Yeah. Uh, Serbian American came up with so many things that we use today that we've totally ignored. Yeah. I think Nikola Tesla, who has then been used as the name of the next person. I'd and he gave away the IP for free. He gave away the, the IP yeah, for free. He had yeah. an open spirit. He really yeah. knew what innovation was about. It's yeah. not about creating and holding like so many people, the Ag- Ab- Abraham Bells that we know and all mm. these guys. He wanted to make sure that everybody has an opportunity by yeah. creating a platform of freeness. Mm. So before Wikipedia and open source and GitHub, Tesla was there. Mm. Um, but the next person I'd also like to speak to, who has a great you know, connection to Tesla, um, is founder of Tesla. Okay, <laughs> Elon Musk. I think Elon yeah. Musk is a fabulous person to, mm. to listen to and see. He's not necessarily the best presenter, mm. but he's the most, he's a genius mm. of his age. I think he has, he's pushed the limits so far out, both on the planet and off the planet, yeah. that he's definitely somebody I'd love to sit for hours and listen to. Yeah. But the last person I'd like to, to listen to is Grass Michelle, mm-hmm. um, wife of former husband, I mean, former uh, South African president Nelson Mandela. I had, a, I had a beautiful opportunity to have lunch with her, mm-hmm. breakfast with her once. And we spoke for five minutes. And I got to see that there's, there's there's something that rubs off you when you hang around people who have seen people who have seen everything. Mm-hmm. And, and that was, I'd love to sit in, in the audience and just listen to her speak about her experiences and mm-hmm. the people she's been with and what life okay. is like now. Nice. So that's, that's quite something. Okay, it's yeah. an interesting mix of people. Yeah. And hopefully I'll represent Elon Musk one day. He's not retaining my cause right now, but one day, you never know. <laughs> so I, I, when I get lunch with him one time next year, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass him your number. <laughs> Do you give him my number? Give you number. Call this guy, he's cool. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much. Thanks for being part of our Trailblazer series. Uh, And as ever, it's a pleasure listening to you. So thanks very much. Amazing to be here. Thank you so much, George. My pleasure. Always. Bye-bye.